Now, if we fast forward 100 or 150 years, uh, curiously, if we look back again to the cultural production and to the portrayals of what would be the future of the city, I think here, suddenly, we have a very different portrayal of the future of the city. And I want to bring these examples in because precisely I think they reveal, as many times, you know, film and other forms of popular entertainment reveal out of the unconscious of our collective thinking, they reveal some of the preoccupations that we are living right now. So you could go from Blade Runner to a much more recent Elysium, and you could notice that if in Blade Runner you were still discussing ideas of a society that would be characterized by the use of uh, very intense technologies that was already characterized by overpopulation and that was very dense, complicated, complex with robotics inserting a new logic and a disruption in the social organization, suddenly with Elysium, which is a film from 2014, uh, you see the planet represented as an extremely divided uh, site in which uh, ideas of gentrification or ideas of the uh, uh, segregated gated community has been taken to an extreme. For those who didn't see the film, I would just say that basically the whole planet has become a slum and there is a ring, a satellite ring around in which beautiful landscapes were reconstructed in which a richer community lives around the world, separated from the planet itself. I mean, these solutions are actually ideas which I think are very revealing of our time. Again, they are sort of experiments, they are avant-garde practices that may hint at something uh, that is coming. And uh, one of them is, uh, for instance, uh, the work of Raum Labor, a Berlin-based collective of architects, who actually provides uh, for a community of immigrants in a suburb of Torino, a place which the government could not longer afford to provide. So when we have refugee crisis and we think how can we actually give response to new populations that are coming to, um, to Europe, how can we respond to those problems, how will we respond to those problems? And another practice, which is both art and architecture, has produced this building in the city in London two years ago, in the context of a festival, of course, but still responding to a very curious problem. And this was called, this one below, was called the first fully functioning theatre uh, in London, which is highly regulated, as you know, in terms of construction uh, conditions, that uh, actually uh, was built with uh, waste material recollected by students along three weeks. So basically, they built an, a theater that responded to uh, questions of comfort, questions of uh, 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 livability that are in regulations, but only using waste material. Again, I'm not saying that we're going there uh, and that we are going to start using this as a static as a response to the problems that we might be facing. What I'm saying is that people are actually, again, unconsciously uh, reproducing these anxieties that we are living uh, in uh, society currently. I'm talking about climate change, I'm talking about refugee crisis, I'm talking about terrorism, I'm talking about a sort of eminence uh, uh, of catastrophe, of permanent catastrophe that becomes the new normal. So how can we actually use this apparent and eminent state of catastrophe to make us think in new ways? to create an out-of-box thinking about these issues. And this was precisely the motive that led to the exhibitions that you saw here in Vienna, and that was uh, uh, started at the Museum of Modern Art, considering precisely that cities probably represent the biggest problem and the biggest challenge uh, over the next few years to humanity in general. And why? Because, as we know, we are becoming mostly urban, uh, 2008 is marked as the year in which, for the first time in history, 50% of the population started living in cities. But what I think is probably more amazing is that uh, by 2030 it will be already two-thirds living in cities. And so the movement from rural areas to cities is still ongoing, 
and it's creating a tension in the city that we'll have, uh, we'll have to solve in every way. This is actually, I would say, the reason why uh, even in, within Europe, in which apparently the overall population is decreasing, cities like Vienna are still growing. Cities like Paris, cities like Lisbon, cities like London. But uh, of the statistics that came out describing this situation, for me, maybe the most troubling was uh, actually that out of these urban populations in about 20 to 30 years, two thirds will be poor. And this is a dramatic change in what we consider uh, our reality. Of course, maybe this is not happening precisely in Europe, but this is happening in the world. And as I say, we have an interlinked, interlinked global reality that cannot no longer be separated. And so the idea was to talk about uh, six, uh, six cities that using this inspiration of so-called tactical urbanisms would consider uh, future scenarios in which we could see a bigger combination of top-down planning, as we traditionally have, which I believe will be uh, probably incapable of solving these problems of uh, growing informality and uh, the slumization of the planet, let's say, and how could we find other ways of having participatory processes coming in, bottom-up initiatives combined with these elements. And so we chose six cities around the world and we had teams that were both local and international research units uh, to actually uh, investigate what could be the future of these cities. And so what they were proposing was that we had to consider infrastructure in a new way and they proposed these elements that would grow over the existing city so that people could then occupy these levels and make the, build, the city build in height just by offering the basic infrastructure and then letting people occupy the rest. This is very radical. This is actually uh, based in radical thinking of uh, architecture in the 70s, thinking about future cities. But what I think is interesting is this idea that uh, maybe there has to be a rebalance or a combination between what the state will be able to offer in economical conditions that are not the same as we lived before and then the ability of people to occupy and to use uh, these spaces. Meaning that there has to be some DIY, do it yourself, some self-construction that would have to be part uh, of the solution. Uh, what uh, was uh, investigated first was, that, was the fact that actually in New York that we think of as a very rich Western city, actually there was a big division, there was a big inequality and a large part of the population was actually living in conditions that would resemble the slums of the beginning of the 20th century in New York itself. And they proposed that instead of the air rights that are available in the city all being collected as they are today in favor of one big developer that develops a big tower, that then these uh, air ratios could also be managed by community <coughs> organizations that would distribute them so as to make infills in the city and construct just smaller additions, making a more equal and a more amenable uh, city. Is that in a way, maybe we have been considering sustainability from the wrong point of view. What I think sustainability uh, um, has been um, moving to over the last years uh, in Europe and in the US is uh, to the idea of producing highly technological materials that are very expensive to produce and of course have energy efficiency and so on, but that in an economy that may be slightly more impoverished, maybe is not sustainable in itself in terms of production. So maybe we would have to go back to a truer sense of sustainability that was always there uh, in, uh, in the history of architecture. I mean, buildings that were produced 500 years ago were actually very sustainable. They were highly efficient in terms of energy, they conserved energy very well because of the mass of walls and so on, and then they were able to resist a long time uh, for a bigger while. So maybe we have to question ourselves 
where do we have to go in the next years to actually act uh, in a sustainable way? And then sustainability cannot forget all parts of the population. And of course, considering that maybe these elements that are coming up in these trends are actually part of that equation. Therefore, top-down combined with bottom-up initiatives has to be part of that equation. Participatory processes have to be part of that equation. Self-building and DIY, maybe not in Vienna, but in 80% of the places of the world, will certainly have certain roles. And there it's curious how going back to the idea of the brick as a very flexible unit is very present in these conditions because it's a material that allows actually for the uh, self-construction and the DIY. But of course also using off-the-shelf technologies. Technologies that are now being used for other areas that suddenly can be integrated into systems of building which traditionally have been kept uh, in very similar along these, uh, these years. And finally, and uh, most interesting for me, uh, uh, last year, 2014, there was this project that tried to reinvent the brick itself. And I think this is particularly interesting here in this context, because of course, although it was an experiment, and it was a mostly failed experiment, because these things are still in trial, what they were trying to make was a brick that was made out of a combination of a fungus and a catalyst that would uh, make the fungus grow into place and then create a brick that was extra light at extreme um, uh, light uh, and insulating capabilities and it was totally uh, um, carbon neutral. So there were no emissions in its construction because it's grown organically and then it could be destroyed just by uh, throwing it into uh, a degradable uh, biodisposal uh, area and it would go back to nature. And I think this is actually a very interesting challenge, which is going back to that very traditional unit that has been with us for thousands of years and thinking how we can improve also with new technologies. How could it transform into becoming something very special that has uh, other ecological values inserted into it? Maybe this is still futuristic and science fiction, but maybe we are able to be getting there very soon. But now there are at the ETH in Zurich these investigations on robotic technology to actually implement a wall with very strange shapes because it's all designed in the computer and then it's passed directly onto the construction. And in New York they didn't use the robot and I don't think the robot is possible in every context, especially <laughs> some of the contexts that I have described here today. But actually they used the software, the app, to uh, understand the exact location of the brick so as to make uh, a very uh, special form. I mean, you see the objects here, and it looks like an art gallery. It looks like an installation in an art gallery. So that maybe can fulfill the aesthetic needs that the architectural discipline will always have, which is to innovate, to produce new cultural statements, to use new materials, to actually be able to also, as architecture, to become something that is interesting and innovative. I think this combination of things in between technology, in between the contribution of the users, uh, in between the needs of the city today, maybe, just maybe, will provide some answers for the future. Thank you.